Today on Historia Gaia. A brief history of China. We cannot talk about China today without mentioning the ancient China. After 10,000 BC, people in China lived by hunting and gathering plants. Then, about 5,000 BC, the Chinese began farming. From about 5,000 BC, rice was cultivated in southern China and millet was grown in the north. By 5000 BC, dogs and pigs were domesticated. By 3000 BC, sheep, and in the south cattle were domesticated. Finally horses were introduced into China between 3000 and 2300. In 486 BC, work began on digging the Grand Canal. At first, only one section was built but the canal was extended by later dynasties. Ancient China Philosophies and Dynasties Zhou Philosophy Human sacrifice ended during the Zhou era but divination continued. At that time the Chinese concept of heaven emerged. Heaven was a kind of universal force. Heaven chose the emperor to rule but it was a moral force. If the king or emperor were evil heaven would send natural disasters as a warning. If the emperor failed to heed the warnings heaven would withdraw its mandate. Social and political order would break down and there would be a revolution. Heaven would choose somebody else to rule. Kong Fuzi. During the Zhou period in China, there was a class of officials who advised kings and rulers on the right way to behave and also how to carry out rituals. The most important of these was Kong Fuzi, known in the West as Confucius. During his lifetime the old feudal social and political order was breaking down. Appalled by this state of affairs Kong Fuzi tried to restore ancient principles. Kong Fuzi taught that everybody should accept their role in life and duties towards others. Rulers had a duty to be benevolent while subjects should be respectful and obedient. Children should honor their parents and everybody should honor their ancestors. Kong Fuzi also believed that rulers should set a good example for their people. Most of all, Kong Fuzi taught consideration for others. At the heart of his teaching was, Ren, which is usually translated as goodness or benevolence. Kong Fuzi said, do not do to others what you do not want to be done to yourself. Kong Fuzi also taught the importance of courtesy and moderation in all things. Kong Fuzi also taught that women should submit to their father when young, to their husbands when married, and to their son if widowed. Women in China were taught values such as humility, submissiveness, and industry. Kong Fuzi never wrote any books but after his death, his followers collected his sayings and wrote them all down. In the centuries after his death, his philosophy became dominant in China and profoundly influenced its culture for more than 2,000 years. One disciple of Kong Fuzi was Mengzi, 372-289 BC, known in the West as Mencius. He stressed the goodness of human nature. He also emphasized the ruler's duty to look after the well-being of his subjects. Mengzi was opposed by Zuni, 298-238 BC. He believed human nature tended to be evil and must be restrained. Legalism. Not everyone agreed with Kong Fuzi that rulers should rule by example. Legalists believed that rulers should be strict the ruler's word should be law. Legalists believed that rulers should be fair but firm and unwavering. One of the Chinese states, Qin, followed legalist teaching. The Qin rulers at first shared power with hereditary nobles but they changed the system so that the parts of their realm were governed by officials appointed by the ruler. They also organized families into groups of five or ten people. The members of each group were made responsible for each other's behavior. Legalists believed that since people are naturally evil punishments should be severe. The people must be made afraid of breaking the law. They also distrusted merchants and believed that only people who owned or worked on the land were trustworthy. Tao philosophy or Taoism. Taoism began in China during the Zhou era. Taoists believe in the Tao, which means the way. The Tao is an indescribable force behind nature and all living things. Taoists believe in wu-wei or non-action, which means going with the natural flow or way of things like a stick being carried along on a stream. 
Taoism also teaches humility and compassion. Taoists worship many different gods. Ancient China Beliefs The Zhou period is sometimes called China's formative period because so much of Chinese philosophy developed at that time. The Chinese form of divination called I Ching was probably developed during the early part of the Zhou era. The idea of yin and yang also appeared during the Zhou dynasty. The ancient Chinese believed that all matter is made of two opposite and complementary principles. Yin is feminine, soft, gentle, dark, receptive, yielding, and wet. Yang is masculine, bright, hard, hot, active, dry, and aggressive. Everything is a mixture of these two opposites. The ancient Chinese also believed there were five elements, wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. During the Zhou period, the Chinese art of acupuncture was invented. The end of the Zhou dynasty. In 771 a people from the west, the Rong invaded and the Zhou moved their capital to Luoyang. Afterward, the power of the Zhongkings declined. The Zhou state broke up into separate states, although it was still nominally a single state with a Zhou king at its head. The nobles under the Zhou king effectively became independent rulers. The different states went to war and the stronger ones conquered the weaker till there were only a few left. Finally, one state, the Qin, conquered its rivals and its ruler became emperor of China. So began the Qin dynasty. The Qin dynasty in China. The first Qin emperor was determined to unite China. He called himself Qin Shi Wangdi and insisted on being called the emperor of China. He introduced standard weights and measures and even insisted that axles should be a standard width. There were, at that time, some local variations in Chinese writing. The emperor insisted that all educated people must use one standard version. Some Chinese scholars opposed the emperor and quoted from old books to do so. Qin Shi Wangdi burned many of the books in China to stop them. He ordered that all books except those on useful subjects such as divination, medicine, and agriculture should be burned. Any scholars who opposed him were branded and sent to work as laborers on the Great Wall. However, the emperor also had 460 scholars buried alive. Being sent to work on the Great Wall was often a death sentence anyway as many men died of exhaustion and exposure. The Qin emperors also continued their legalist policies. They banned private ownership of weapons and ordered many aristocratic families to move to the capital, Xianyang, where they could be easily controlled. China was divided into 34 areas called commanderies. A civilian governor ruled each but each also had a general in charge of then soldiers in the region. The Qin emperors were keen to keep civil and military power in separate hands. All officials were appointed by the emperor and were answerable to him. The Qin emperors also built roads and irrigation canals. Parts of the Great Wall of China already existed but the first Qin emperor had them joined together. The ordinary people were forced to work on his projects. Qin rule was harsh and cruel punishments were common. When Qin Shi Wangdi died he was buried in a tomb with over 7,000 terracotta warriors. This army was discovered in 1974. Not surprisingly the cruel punishments introduced by the Qin emperors together with the heavy taxes and forced labor caused much resentment. In northern China, a rebellion broke out led by two peasants, Chen Sheng and Wu Yang. Later a second rebellion began further south led by Xiangyu. The northern rebellion was defeated but the southern one succeeded. The last Qin emperor was executed. However, Xiangyu quarreled with his lieutenant Liu Bang. A civil war began which ended when Xiang Yu was killed and Liu Bang became the first Han Emperor. The Han Dynasty in China. The Zhou Dynasty was China's formative period when its philosophies emerged. During the Han Dynasty, Chinese civilization crystallized. During this era, China was a brilliant civilization. Han inventions include the watermill and the chain pump. This pump was worked by feet and helped to irrigate the rice fields. The first Han Emperor was called Gaozi. He was more humane than the Qin Emperors and he abolished many of their savage punishments. 
He kept some of the legalist policies of his predecessors but he also adopted some Confucian policies. His successes came to favor Confucianism more and more. In 165 BC the emperor decreed that anyone wishing to become an official must sit an exam, which would test his knowledge of Confucian teaching. In 124 BC another emperor founded an imperial academy where candidates studied Confucian classics, the Book of Changes, the Book of Rites, the Book of Documents, the Book of Songs, and the Spring and Autumn Annals. If they passed their exams they were given posts as officials. China came to be governed by a civil service trained in Confucian thought. Like the Qin the Han emperors distrusted merchants and taxed them heavily. In 119 BC the emperor made the manufacture of salt, iron, and alcohol state monopolies, previously they were the most profitable industries. Under the Han, agriculture continued to improve partly due to an increasing number of irrigation schemes, partly due to the increasing use of buffaloes to pull plows and partly due to crop rotation which was introduced into China about 100 BC. The population of China continued to grow and a census in 2 AD showed it was 57 million. During the Han era, large amounts of silk were exported to the West. It passed through many hands to the Roman Empire. In return, merchants brought gems, glass, and vines to China. The ship's rudder was invented in China in the 1st century AD. About 100 AD a man named Kai Lun invented paper, previously people had written on silk or bamboo. Meanwhile, Buddhism first reached China in the 1st century AD but it took a long time to be accepted. During the Han era, feng shui was developed. Elements of the craft existed before then but it was during this period that feng shui became a coherent philosophy. The fall of the Han Dynasty. After 168 AD the Han Dynasty declined. Internal fighting weakened it. When an emperor died there was usually a struggle to see who would replace him. The dynasty was also undermined by natural disasters and popular discontent. Two rebellions began in 84 AD, the Yellow Turbans Rebellion and the Five Pecks of Grain Rebellion. Both of these were crushed but the generals sent to defeat them began to act independently of the emperor. They started to fight each other. In 189 AD one general captured the capital, Luoyang, and killed 2,000 eunuchs. After that, the emperor became a puppet ruler. Generals had real power. However, the last Han emperor was removed in 220 AD. Afterward, China split into three parts each ruled by a general. The era of division in China. After the fall of the Han dynasty China split into three kingdoms. The Wei Kingdom in the north, the Shu Kingdom in the west, and the Wu Kingdom in the south. In 263 AD the Wei Kingdom conquered the Shu Kingdom. In 280 the Wu Kingdom was also conquered and China was briefly reunited. However, peace was short-lived. In the 1st and 2nd centuries AD a people called the Xiongnu raided in northern China. In the 2nd and 3rd centuries, the Chinese emperors allowed them to settle inside China's borders, hoping they could be assimilated. The emperors employed the Xiongnu as soldiers. However in 304, the Xiongnu turned on their masters. They took the city of Luoyang in 311 and then took Chang'an in 316. Eventually, they overran northern China. The north of the country then split into rival kingdoms, all with non-Chinese rulers. This period is called the Sixteen Kingdoms. Many Chinese fled from the north to the south of the country. However Chinese civilization did not disappear from the north. The Xiongnu was only a small minority of the population. Most of the people were Chinese and they carried on as they had for centuries. In the south Chinese emperors continued to rule but they were unable to capture the north. Then in the late 4th century the Torba, a Turkish people from Central Asia, started taking over northern China. By 386 they had conquered it all. The Torba then adopted the Chinese way of life. They adopted Chinese costumes and Chinese writing and many of them married Chinese people. Their rulers learned to speak Chinese. Slowly the people were assimilated. However, a civil war began in northern China in 524. After a decade of fighting the north split into two parts, east, and west. 
They were reunited in 577. In that year the Chinese invented matches. Then in 581, a general seized the throne and quickly conquered the south. In 589, he began the short-lived Sui dynasty. There were only two Sui emperors, Wendi and Yang. The two Sui emperors attempted to invade Korea four times. Each time they failed. They also undertook expensive public works such as rebuilding cities and extending China's Great Canal. The Great Canal was extended in 605 to 609 using forced labor so that it connected the north and south of China. After Yang's death, China split into warring states again. Changes in society in China. The disorder in China and the weakness of emperors meant the aristocracy gained more wealth and power. At the same time, many of the peasants were reduced to serfdom. Serfs were halfway between slaves and free men. Often they were forced to turn to the lords for protection and the price was serfdom. During the era of division, Buddhism grew in China and many temples and monasteries were built. The Chinese upper class became more sympathetic to Buddhism and the rulers of the north of China made it their official religion. Taoism also developed during this period. Many Taoist scriptures were written at that time. In 618 after several years of war, the different parts of China were reunited by the Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty in China. The Tang Dynasty that lasted from 618 to 907 was one of China's greatest eras. During this period China was probably the most advanced civilization in the world. Under the Tang emperors, the arts flourished. Chinese poetry and lacquer making blossomed. Perhaps the greatest poet was Li Bo, 701-762. The Tang emperors extended their ruler over Central Asia and foreign influences seeped into China. As well as Buddhists there were Muslims in the capital Chang'an. There were also Christians. Trade and commerce also flourished under the Tang. Gunpowder was probably invented in China around the year 900 AD. At first, it was used for rockets, grenades, and bombs that were placed against the wooden gates of enemy cities. Printing with wooden blocks was also invented in China during the Tangera. The earliest printed book is the Diamond Sutra, printed in 868 AD. Although the first Tang Emperor, Gaoju, 618 to 626, was enthroned in 618 it took him another six years of fighting before he brought all of China under his control. When he did China entered a period of peace and stability. One of the most remarkable Tang emperors was Empress Wu, the only woman ever to rule China. She was a concubine of Emperor Gaozongan, 643 to 683. In those days the emperor had one wife, the empress, but he had many concubines. One emperor had 6,000 of them. Wu is said to have murdered her own baby daughter then accused the reigning empress of being the murderer. Wu then replaced her as an empress. In 660 the emperor suffered a stroke. After that Wu effectively ruled China. When Gaozong died in 683 his son Zhengzong succeeded him, but not for long. Wu forced Zhengzong to abdicate in favor of another son, who was effectively her puppet. In 690 Wu did away with puppet rulers and took the throne herself. She ruled China until 705. Then, when she was very old, she was forced to abdicate. Wu was a very powerful woman and she was utterly ruthless. However from the middle of the 8th century, the Tang dynasty declined. In 751 the Chinese were defeated by the Arabs at the Battle of Talas River. Afterward, China lost control of Central Asia. Then in 755, a general named An Lushan led a rebellion. It was the beginning of a civil war, which lasted for eight years. The civil war only ended with help from the Uyghurs, Turkish people. The fighting caused a great deal of destruction in China. The Tang dynasty never really recovered. By the 9th century, Buddhism had grown very influential in China. However, monks were exempt from paying taxes and the Emperor Wuzong, 840-846 presented this. There was also a shortage of copper in China to make coins. The Buddhist monks were blamed because they used so much copper to make bronze statues, bells, and chimes. 
In 845 Wazong ordered that monasteries should hand over their land and property like iron and bronze tools. All monks under the age of 40 were ordered to return to civilian life. Many temples were destroyed. The order was rescinded in 846 but it was a severe blow to Buddhism in China. Then in 874, another rebellion began. The rebels captured Guangzhou, Canton, and massacred foreigners. They captured the capital Chandan in 880. However, the emperor was not entirely defeated. He asked Turkish people for help. The emperor recaptured the capital in 884. However, the power of the Tang emperors was failing. The last Tang emperor was removed in 907. The Tang was replaced by the Song dynasty. The Song dynasty in China. After 907 China split into separate states once again. The north of China was ruled by five short-lived dynasties. The northeast was an independent kingdom ruled by the Qidan Liao dynasty. The south split into ten kingdoms. In 960 Taizu became emperor of the north. He managed to persuade all but two of the southern states to submit to him. His son Tazong captured the remaining two and by 979 China was once again reunited, except for the northeast which remained independent. During the Song era, China's economy boomed. A new form of early ripening rice from Vietnam improved agriculture. Irrigation was also extended. The result was a population boom. Meanwhile, trade and commerce prospered and towns and cities grew much larger. Industries like iron, ceramics, silk, lacquer, and papermaking flourished. China was probably the richest country in the world. Overseas trade also grew. The compass had been used for divination for centuries but by the 12th century, it was being used to navigate ships. However, Song China was surrounded by powerful enemies. The result was suspicion and dislike of anything foreign. Buddhism declined in popularity because it was a foreign religion. Under the Song, Confucianism underwent a revival. Educated people saw it as a way of strengthening Chinese culture. Scholars wrote commentaries on Confucian classics and a new philosophy called Neo-Confucianism was worked out which dominated China for centuries. The Song emperors created a powerful bureaucracy to rule China. The civil service was greatly expanded. There were state schools in China where men could study in order to sit exams for the civil service. Under the Song, the number of schools was greatly increased. China came to be ruled by an elite of scholar officials. Northeast China was still independent. It was ruled by the Qidan Liao dynasty. They also ruled over a people called the Jurchen. However, in 1114, the Jurchen turned on their masters and by 1125 they had captured the entire northeast. They attacked the rest of China. In 1127 they captured the capital, Kaifeng. The Jurchen overran all of northern China but they were unable to capture the south. In 1141 the Chinese emperor made a treaty with them by which they kept the north and he kept the south. For this reason, the Song dynasty is divided into two periods, the Northern Song period before China was split in two and the Southern Song period afterward. However the Chinese soon absorbed the Jurchen. They kept the civil service entrance exams and appointed Chinese men as officials. The Jurchen also began to wear Chinese costumes and speak the Chinese language. After 1191 the Jurchen were allowed to marry the Chinese and many of them did so. In 1206 the Southern Chinese invaded the North. However, the native Chinese in the north had grown used to Jurchen rule and they did not rise in rebellion. The invasion was defeated. The Yuan Dynasty in China. However, in the early 13th century, there was a new threat the Mongols. Under their leader Genghis Khan, they raided northern China in 1213-14. In 1215 they sacked and burned Beijing. Then they turned their attention west. After the death of Genghis Khan in 1226 the Mongols invaded northern China and by 1234 they had conquered it all. However, in the south, the emperors managed to hold the Mongols at bay for some decades. In 1264 Kublai Khan, the grandson of Genghis made Beijing his winter capital, the summer capital was in Mongolia. 
In 1272 he began calling himself Yuan or Great Founder. So began the Yuan Dynasty. Kublain invaded southern China in 1268 and conquered it in a campaign lasting nine years in 1275 the Mongols captured the strategically vital city of Xianyang. That proved to the turning point. The old Song dynasty finally came to an end in 1279 when the Mongols won a naval battle. However Kublai realized it would be more profitable to rule China and tax it rather than plunder it. He also realized that in order to rule he would need to win over the Chinese. According to legend an advisor told him that you can conquer China on horseback but you cannot rule it on horseback. Kublai enlisted Chinese officials to help him rule, although the most senior officials were all Mongols. Nevertheless the Mongols were never absorbed by the Chinese, unlike previous invaders. They did not accept Chinese customs. The Chinese remained second-class citizens. Society was divided into four classes. The Mongols were at the top, and then below them were other non-Chinese people. Below them were the northern Chinese who were more accustomed to foreign rule than the southern Chinese at the bottom. The Mongols also extended the Great Canal to their winter capital at Beijing. The period of the Mongol or Yuan ruler was not a happy one for China. The population of China fell significantly and the country became less prosperous. In the 1350s rebellions broke out in China and Yuan's rule began to break down. In 1368 the last Yuan emperor fled to Mongolia and the Yuan dynasty was replaced by the Ming dynasty. The Ming dynasty in China. The first Ming emperor Hongwu captured Beijing in 1368 but he moved the capital to Nanjing. It was some time before he ruled all of China. Not till 1387 did he rule all the country. A later emperor, Yang Lo, decided to move the capital back to Beijing. Between 1406 and 1421 he built the great palace called the Forbidden City. Outside it was the imperial city that was built for officials. Outside was the outer city for ordinary people. Under the Ming emperors China once again became prosperous and powerful. Despite the inevitable famines, which occurred from time to time. In the 16th century, new crops were introduced from the Americas, sweet potatoes, maize, and peanuts. These new foods were very useful because they would grow where other crops would not. The Ming also rebuilt the Great Wall. During their reign industry and trade flourished in China. Vast quantities of cotton were spun and a huge amount of porcelain was made. In the early 15th century the emperor sent ships on six expeditions. They sailed to India, Arabia, and the east coast of Africa. One of them brought back the first giraffe ever seen in China. However, the Ming emperors became increasingly inward-looking and tried to isolate China from the outside world. Perhaps the period of Mongol rule increased the distrust of foreigners and the dislike of foreign influences. The Portuguese reached China by sea in 1513. In 1557 they were allowed to settle in Macau. However, the emperors were determined to limit contact with Europeans. The period of prosperity in China ended in the nearly 17th century. In the 1630s Ming rule began to break down. China was struck by famine and epidemics. Rebellions broke out and the government was unable to suppress them. The rebels took city after city. Finally, in 1644, the last Ming emperor committed suicide. However, there were two rebel factions and the leaders of both claimed to be emperor. Neither could restore order. Meanwhile northeast of China lived a people called the Manchu, they gave their name to Manchuria. In 1618 they began to conquer the Chinese who lived north of the Great Wall. From 1636 their leader claimed to be the true emperor of China and took the name Qing. In 1644 a Chinese general believed the Manchu or Qing were more likely to restore order in China than the rebel leaders so he led them through the wall. They quickly defeated the rebels, in the north, and their leader installed himself as emperor. So began the Qing dynasty. The Qing Dynasty in China. The Qing or Manchus easily took control of northern China but it took much longer for them to conquer the south. 
They did not control all of China until 1660. A rebellion occurred in 1673 but it was eventually crushed. In 1683 the king captured Taiwan, the last stronghold of people loyal to the Ming dynasty. The king commanded all men to shave the front of their heads and tie the hair at the back into a queue. At first, the king confiscated much land from the native Chinese, and the two races were segregated. However, the king gradually adopted Chinese ways and the Chinese eventually accepted them, to a certain extent, as a legitimate dynasty. The king created a strong and prosperous state. By 1697 they had conquered Mongolia and in 1720 Tibet was made a protectorate. The population of China grew rapidly in the 18th century. This was partly due to new crops introduced from the Americas. It was partly due to new forms of rice which made it possible to grow three crops a year in some parts of China. In the 18th century, trade and industry boomed in China. The iron industry prospered and vast quantities of cotton were made. China also made huge amounts of porcelain. Much of this was exported to Europe. An increasing amount of tea was exported to Britain. The Chinese imported some iron goods and wool from Britain but the British had to pay for most of their tea with silver. After 1750 they were confined to Guangzhou and were not allowed to trade in any other port. In 1793 they sent Lord McCartney to try and negotiate a trade treaty with the Chinese Emperor. However, the Emperor made it clear he was not interested in manufactured goods from Europe and he refused to change the terms of trade. However, although China was once a very advanced civilization it was now falling behind Europe in technology. Soon she would be weaker than the European powers. Worse the British found it increasingly hard to pay for tea and other goods with silver. So they exported large amounts of opium to China. Imports of opium were banned in 1800 and in 1813 smoking opium was made illegal. However the British soon joined forces with Chinese smugglers. The British ships anchored off the coast and Chinese boats took tea out to them. They brought British goods back to the shore. Increasingly the British resorted to exchanging opium for tea. Soon there were many opium addicts in China. The Opium Wars. The Opium Wars were a shameful episode in British history. The Chinese government took action to combat this menace. In 1839 an official called Lin Zizu was sent to Guangzhou to stop the opium smuggling. He commanded the British to hand over their stores of opium. Reluctantly they obeyed. However, the British government sent a fleet to blockade Guangzhou and the ports of Ningbo and Tianjin. In 1841 a Chinese official negotiated a treaty. He agreed to give the British Hong Kong and pay what it cost the British to send a fleet to China. However, neither side was satisfied with this treaty and the war resumed. The British sent a second fleet and occupied several ports. This time the Chinese were forced to pay a much larger amount of money. They were also forced to open five ports to British merchants Guangzhou, Xiamen, Fuzhou, Ningbo, and Shanghai. British citizens were to answer only to the British authorities if they committed any crime while they were in China. Chinese tariffs on British goods were to be only 5%. Soon afterward the Chinese were forced to sign similar treaties with other European countries. Unfortunately, the Chinese had fallen behind in military technology and they were no match for the European forces. The First Opium War of 1840-42 was followed by a second conflict. Neither side was satisfied with the Treaty of 1842. The Chinese naturally resented the treaty. The British accused Chinese officials of dragging their feet and obstructing trade. The conflict came to a head in 1856 when the Chinese boarded a ship called the Arrow. In 1858 the British sent another fleet to China and the Chinese were forced to sign another treaty. Ten more ports were open to trade and foreigners were to be allowed to travel around China. In 1859 British officials returned to ratify the treaty but they were prevented from entering China. However in 1860, the British sent another expedition. This time the British burned the Emperor's summer palace. China was forced to open ports in the north to trade and to pay a large sum of money to Britain. The Decline of the Qing Dynasty By the late 18th century the Qing Dynasty was in decline. 
This was partly due to a rise in the population. The population of China began to outstrip its resources and the peasants grew poorer. As a result, rebellions broke out. In the years 1796-1804 the White Lotus sect led a rebellion. Although that rebellion was eventually crushed it was followed by another rebellion in 1813 led by the Eight Trigrams sect. This rebellion cost 70,000 lives before it was defeated. However by far the most serious rebellion was the Taiping Rebellion of 1850-1864, which is estimated to have cost 20 million lives. It was led by Hong Sichuan who believed he was the son of God and the younger brother of Jesus. He preached a mixture of some Christian beliefs and some communism. His followers sold their property and put the money in a common fund. The land was distributed among his followers he also banned foot binding, smoking opium, and wearing the queue. His followers also destroyed Buddhist and Taoist temples. He took Nanjing in 1853 and led a long rebellion. It took the king more than a decade to crush it. Furthermore, other rebellions broke out in China. It took another four years to put down bandits in the north called the Nanan. There were also rebellions by Muslims in outlying areas. These were not defeated until 1873. In the late 19th century the Chinese government made some attempts to introduce European technology. None of them were very successful. In partnership with Chinese merchants, the government opened coal mines, started a steam shipping company, and opened ironworks and cotton mills. They also built a telegraph network and a small network of railways. However, all these efforts at reform met with resistance from traditional Confucian scholars. Worse in 1893 the Empress Sixen took some money intended for the navy and used it to build a marble ship in the shape of a paddle steamer. China remained fundamentally unchanged in the late 19th century, unlike Japan, which changed rapidly. In 1894 came war with Japan. A rebellion broke out in Korea in 1894 and Chinese troops were sent there. However, the Japanese navy sank a Chinese troop carrier, provoking war. The Japanese army and navy quickly won stunning victories and the Chinese were forced to sign a humiliating treaty. They were forced to cede Taiwan to Japan and to allow the Japanese to build factories in China. China was also forced to pay a large sum of money. Afterward, European powers took advantage of China's weakness by forcing her to cede more territory to them. After the shock of the Sino-Japanese War many Chinese realized that China must modernize otherwise she would be carved up between the foreign powers. In 1898 some officials persuaded the emperor to decree a series of reforms. However the Empress Dowager, a retired Empress, Sixi put a stop to it. She arrested most of the reformers and executed them on the trumped-up charge that they were plotting to overthrow the government. Boxer Rebellion. In 1900 Chinese resentment of foreign interference boiled over into the Boxer Rebellion. It began with a secret society called the Harmonious Fists. They hated Christian missionaries and foreign influence. The society grew rapidly after 1898 and friction between them and the missionaries grew. Afraid. The British sent 2,000 men to protect their nationals in Beijing. However, the boxers cut the railway to Tianjin, and the British were forced to withdraw their soldiers. Sixi decided to join the boxers and she declared war. The foreigners in Beijing shut themselves in their buildings and the Chinese lay siege. However, a force of 20,000 European soldiers marched into Beijing and sacked it. Afterward, the Chinese were forced to pay a large sum of money to the Europeans as compensation. The Fall of the Qing Dynasty in 1901 the Empress Dowager, Sixi, changed her mind and decided some reform was needed after all. Primary and secondary education was changed to include Western subjects. Then in 1905 the civil service entry exams, which had been used for 2000 years, were abolished. Some attempt was made to reform the army and navy. In 1908 she agreed to make the Chinese monarchy a constitutional one. In 1909 provincial assemblies were elected. However, only a limited number of men were allowed to vote and the assemblies had little power. After 1910 there was a national assembly but it too had very limited power. The limited reforms of the king satisfied nobody and in 1911 they were swept away by a revolution. China became a republic.